Hi, we are diving into chapter nine, which is a super fun chapter because we're learning all about your senses. So let me switch to screen share mode, pull up my little PowerPoint here, and we can get started. So here's chapter nine, here's our learning outcomes, which are all listed already for you in your weekly folder. Let's start talking about the general senses. So general senses are, um, these are things that don't have a specific organ associated with it. So this is not vision, this is not hearing, taste, etc. This is general senses. So here's like temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration, proprioception. Proprioception is body position. So knowing that I'm sitting, knowing that my arm is like this, knowing that, you know, my head is facing this way, just general body position. So this, these are Senses that are picked up by special sense receptors. They're specialized cells or cell processes, little parts of cells. The simplest are basically just dendrites of sensory neurons. Um, they can be um, stimulated by several different stimuli, like chemical, pressure, temperature, uh, and they can have little um, receptor specificity to them. So again, just free nerve endings there, just saying, hey, something's going on. Our general sensory receptors can be classified according to the nature of the stimulus. So they can be nociceptors. Nociceptors are pain receptors. They have very large receptive fields and broad sensitivity. There are type A and type C um, pain receptors um, that carry this type of sensation. There are also thermoreceptors. Thermoreceptors are our temperature receptors. They're located within the dermis, within the skeletal muscles, within the liver, and within the hypothalamus. Remember, our hypothalamus is our body's thermostat. So cold receptors are three to four times more numerous than, than warm receptors. Think about the importance of that. You also have mechanoreceptors. These are sensitive to changes in the plasma membrane. So you touch something, it's changing that plasma membrane, that shape of the cell membrane, and that is being sensed by these mechanoreceptors. They come in three different categories. They can be a proprioceptor, monitoring position and joints and muscles, a baroreceptor, which is detecting pressure, uh, such as in the walls of blood vessels and portions of the digestive tract. There's also tactile receptors. That's the touch, pressure, vibration, sensations. Finally, we have chemoreceptors, which are sensitive to chemicals dissolved in body fluids. There they are, general, general receptors, no C, thermo, mechano, chemo. Our mechano receptors can be propio, baro, or tactile receptors. So overall general receptors in the skin have the greatest diversity. Uh, the tactile sensitivity can be altered by infection, disease, or other sensory neuron damage. Uh, and tactile responses can be used for diagnosis. Sensory loss along a particular dermatome, a particular area of the skin surface, can help identify which specific spinal nerve or nerves have been damaged. Here's just an overview of these various skin receptors. You have free nerve endings. You have the root hair plexus associated with the uh, root hair, hair root. Uh, you have tactile discs, which are within the epidermis. You have tactile corpuscles, lemelated corpuscles, and raffini corpuscles. So um, again, these free nerve endings, these are branching tips of sensory neurons. They're not protected, they're not specific. They're responding to all types of stimuli. So they're the most common receptor in the skin, and they're just letting you know, hey, something's here. It could be pain. It could be heat. It could be cold. It could be a touch. Right? And that's what they look like. They're just all over the place embedded in the epidermis. Root hair plexus is monitoring distortions and movements across the body surface. When the hair is displaced, when the hair moves, that little root hair plexus is fired and tells the brain, hey, we have something going on over here around this hair. It produces those action potentials or signals. There they are, they're associated with every individual hair root. Our tactile discs are fine, and fine touch and pressure receptors. The dendrites of afferent fibers come in contact with specialized epithelial cells in the epidermis, and when they're distorted, they um, produce an action potential. Tactile discs. Um, tactile corpuscles are also called Meissner corpuscles. These are providing fine touch, pressure, low frequency vibrations. They basically will adapt to our stimulus within a second. So um, this is uh, you touch, I put my arm on my desk, and at first I realized that my arm is on my desk. But now that my arm's been sitting there for a minute, 
I don't really think about it anymore. It's not not something that my brain needs to be aware of. So it, that's adaptation. It, my body's adapting to the fact that my arm is sitting on this hard surface. They are very abundant in the eyelids, fingertips, external genitalia, again, because you don't want too much stimulus down there, right? Your underwear is on. That's all you really need to know about. Um, they can be modified, and they have a fibrous capsule anchoring them to the dermis. There they are. Tactile corpuscles or Meissner corpuscles. You also have lemonated corpuscles, also called Pacinian corpuscles. They're sensitive to deep pressure. They're most sensitive uh, in pulsing or high frequency vibrations. They are located in the dermis, mammary glands, and external genitalia. They're found also within the mesenteries of our abdomen, the pancreas, the urethra, the bladder. Again, just pressure inside. There they are. And then Ruffini corpuscles, these are sensitive to pressure and distortion of the deep dermis. So there's very little, if any, adaptation. Um, so there is a constant awareness that this stimulus is there. Um, it's surrounded by a capsule. It's kind of, dis any distortion is going to um, cause them to be activated and to send a message through their aff afferent fiber. There they are. Again, they're just deeper in that dermis layer. Uh, here's some questions. You can pause the video, go back and review. Just remember that I'm not going to be giving you diagrams on your tester quizzes. So um, you really just have to know function. I'm not going to ask you what is this specific little bubble here. Your lab instructor may. Let's talk about baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are stretch receptors that monitor changes in pressure. They have free nerve endings branching within um, specialized elastic tissues. Any change in pressure can stretch or recoil that elastic tissue, which is going to cause that action potential to be generated. Um, baroreceptors are located in various, various locations throughout the body. The carotid aortic sinuses, uh, which are special locations in our circulatory system, they're there to monitor blood pressure. And as they, change, as they sense changes in blood pressure, they're going to provide feedback to the brain and the brain can then tell the heart to speed up or slow down accordingly. They're also located in the lungs to indica indicate and monitor the degree of lung expansion. Um, so as the body may be changing its respiration rate due to increased oxygen demands or whatever, the baroreceptors are there to make sure that it's done properly. They're also there within the colon to make sure that your colon is not getting backed up with feces. So once your colon gets full, it's going to those baroreceptors are going to be activated, telling your brain, hey, we need to go to the bathroom. The digestive tract, again, just helping to propel the food through the digest digestive tract as well as the urinary bladder wall to monitor volume and trigger urination. That's the locations of our baroreceptors. Chemoreceptors detect small, really small changes in specific chemical compounds or um, specific chemicals. So they play a role within reflexes of our respiration and cardiovascular functions. They're located within the medulla oblongata, monitoring pH and carbon dioxide levels uh, of the cerebral spinal fluid as well as the blood. They're monitoring the in the carotid bodies and aortic bodies, monitoring pH, carbon dioxide, and oxygen levels, all important for our body's homeostasis. There they are. You can pause the video, go back and answer these three questions. There are also special senses. So the, those are the general senses. Let's talk about special senses. These are the ones that have special sense organs. So they have information that's going to go to a specific area of our cerebral cortex. You have five special senses, olfaction, vision, gustation, equilibrium, and hearing. So let's talk about olfaction and taste first. Olfaction sensory receptors are basically modified neurons. Gustation sensory receptors are special receptor cells uh, that communicate with neurons. Um, so both olfaction and gustation have sense special sensory epithelium. They're exposed to the environment, right? Our mouth and our tongue and our nose are all exposed to the outside. And that information goes right up to the central nervous system for processing. Um, the touch receptor, again, this, these are just special receptors that communicate with neurons, whereas our olfactory epithelium is has neurons embedded in it also, like inside our nose, our actual neurons that are going to take that information up to our brain. So hearing equilibrium receptors are different. The sensory receptors are protected from the external environment. 
So sensory information is integrated and organized before it's sent to the central nervous system. The receptors of hearing are called hair cells. When the free surfaces are covered with something called microvilli, they're like little hairs. And as the, as the um, sound waves move over those little hairs, they're going to trigger their, them moving, and then that signal is going to travel down the neuron to uh, the brain. External forces, again, it, this says external force distorts hair cell plasma membrane. That's what I'm saying. The waves of energy, the waves of sound energy come in and vibrate and move these little hair cells, and that neuron can send an action potential to the brain saying, we heard something. This is what I'm talking about, displacement, those little hair cells. And here's the sensory neuron taking that information back. So let's talk about how olfaction works. Olfaction is our sense of smell. We have paired olfactory organs in the nasal cavity. They're basically in there within the bony protection of our, of our nose. Odorants are the dissolved chemicals. Uh, they're small organic chemicals, and very, very few are needed in order to activate an olfactory receptor. Sense of smell is extremely important in survival. You smell smoke, oh, that's dangerous, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be caught in a forest fire or whatever you smell. Uh, gas, you smell ammonia, right? All of those things are, you just need to smell them in very small quantities in order for you to recognize what it is. Sense is a very, uh, the sense of smell is a very powerful sense. So let's talk about the olfactory pathway. The olfactory pathway is when your sensory neurons are stimulated by chemicals in the air. The axons leave the olfactory epithelium, go in through, into the brain through what's called the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone communicate with the olfactory bulb. Now, those axons will then leave the olfactory bulb and go back the olfactory tract. The olfactory tract is then going to take that information to the olfactory cortex, the limbic system, and the hypothalamus. Remember, the limbic system and the hypothalamus are our feelings, our memory, uh, and hypothalamus is our body's response. This is our hormones and activation pathways, etc. So strong emotional um, response and memories are associated with smell. So here you see the whole pathway for all my visual people. Smell arose, all those little odorants get dissolved in the mucus in our nose and get trapped by these little olfactory epithelia, the mucus in there, and that goes back to the olfactory bulb, go back to the olfactory tract, and that olfactory tract is going to take that information to the limbic system, hypothalamus, and olfactory cortex. Let's talk about taste. Um, taste or gustation is providing information about the foods and liquids that we put into our mouth. They have taste receptors on the superior surface of the tongue. We also have them on the back of our throat and on the inside of our cheeks. The lingual papillae are the projections on the tongue. These are taste buds that are on our tongue. They're not all the same. You have circumvallate papillae. These are large, um, kind of pointy shaped, uh, broad and, they're like broad, round, little like mushroom shaped kind of uh, taste buds. And each papilla can have up to 100 taste buds on them. You have fungiform, which also have taste buds, and filiform. We don't have as many filiform. Filiform are, are more uh, sharp and pointy. Cats have a lot of those on their tongue. Um, so taste information go, goes back to the brain through cranial nerves, the vagus nerve, the glossopharyngeal, the um, facial nerve. And we have major ten taste sensations. Uh, there's four major ones, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter, but there's also one called umami. This is one that's sensitive to um, like a, a protein type taste. It, it's like a, like beef broth. It's kind of like a salty protein taste. Um, and we also have water receptors, which are concentrated in the back of the throat and give our hypothalamus information about the water content in our mouth. Here you see some of our, um, we have just a few filiform. The fungi form are a little rounder, and then the majority of our taste buds are these circumvallate papillae, which have lots and lots of taste buds on them. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about the external ear. This is what you see, your visual, the uh, visible portion of the ear collects and directs the sound waves in towards the middle of middle ear and the elastic cartilage gives that oracle flexibility so that it's not uh, easily damaged. The external acoustic meatus or external acoustic canal is the passageway through the temporal bone allowing for the sound waves to go into your ear. It's lined with little hairs and ceruminous glands that secrete 
cerumen or earwax. Cerumen is basically there to slow microorganisms, uh, reduce the chances of an ear infection, and prevent foreign objects and insects ew, uh, from entering your ear. You, the middle ear starts with the tympanic membrane or eardrum. It's basically an air-filled chamber. Um, the tympanic membrane is the eardrum and it's kind of like a thin sheet and it's also connected to the throat through the auditory tube. This is why if you plug your nose, plug your mouth and apply pressure, you can pop your ears, pop your ears. You're basically blowing air in through that um, auditory tube or eustachian tube, permitting pressure, pressure equalization on either side of that tympanic membrane. You also have the auditory ossicles in the middle ear. Those are your three ear bones. The internal ear has your organs for hearing and equilibrium. Um, it's basically uh, a bony labyrinth inside of that temporal bone. Here you see external ear, middle ear, inner ear, auditory tube, external acoustic meatus, tympanic membrane, or inner ear ossicles, and we'll get into talking about all of these guys in just a minute. Let's talk about those auditory ossicles. There are three, Malleus incus stapes, um, and that's the order that they are in the ear. They're located in the middle ear. These are the smallest joints of the body. They're the smallest bones of the body as well, and they're basically there to um, take the vibrations from the tympanic membrane and communicate that to the cochlea. Here they are, Malleus incus stapes. They're held in place by little muscles. And um, the stapes communicates with something called the oval window. And that's how sound gets transferred into the inner ear. You can pause the video, go back and answer these three questions. We're gonna move on and talk about the bony labyrinth. This is the um, shell of bone that holds the inner ear structures. So it's composed of three parts, the semicircular canals, the vestibule, and the cochlea. There's also a perilymph, which is just a little fluid that flows in this area. So the membranous labyrinth is the actual tissue structure that has set the cells. The bony labyrinth is that the indentation of this um, structure in the, the temporal bone. And then in between the two structures is the perilymph. So that membranous labyrinth, like I said, that is that is that the membrane structure that's lined with cells that is now filled with endolymph. Endolymph um, is the kind of inner fluid of our inner ear. There are two main parts of our membranous labyrinth. One is the vestibular complex and one is the cochlear duct. So the vestibular complex has the semicircular ducts the saccule and utricle, which contain our equilibrium receptors, and the cochlear duct, which has the cochlea, um, which is that little snail-shaped structure. So here you can see the membranous labyrinth. Notice that the bone has been taken off, right? So there's no perilymph here. The endolymph is inside of these structures. It's just a little membrane inside of the bones. Saccule, utricle, and our semicircular ducts, and the cochlear duct. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about those semicircular ducts. There are three ducts, anterior, posterior, lateral. Each duct has something called an ampullae. The ampullae is the extended or expanded area. Receptors of the ampullae are called the crista ampullaris, and the processes of the hair cells are embedded in something called a cupula. It's like a, a gel structure. So here you see the cupula, crista ampullaris with the little hair cells. And again, we're zoomed in to this little enlarged part here <coughs> called the crista ampullaris. So endolymph, the, the cupula basically floats in the endolymph. It's just kind of flowing back and forth, back and forth. If you rotate your head, you know that you've rotated your head. Your equilibrium knows that because the endolymph inside of um, this cupula is, is moving with that. And so the movement of that cupula will go from side to side, distorting pro uh, receptors, and then allowing your hair cells to send the signal that you've moved your head. So again, just twisting your head is gonna move that little cupula guy this way or that way, and that's sending the signal to your brain so that your brain knows that your head has moved. 
There's also rotational planes. These, the semicircular ducts, lie in the three rotational planes. You have horizontal, vertical, and um, kind of they, they're responding to those rotational movements. So shaking your head no is going to stimulate that lateral uh, semicircular duct. Sorry. I didn't have enough coffee this morning. The vertical rotation is going to stimulate that anterior semicircular duct. Tilting your head is going to um, stimulate that posterior semicircular duct. So there they are. And again, just lying in the three planes of space so that your body can know kind of where, where you are. The saccule and utricle are uh, providing that equilibrium sensation. So the sensory structure of the utricle and saccule is called a macula. Hair cells are basically embedded in this ge gelatinous like structure and there's um, these little tiny crystals called otoliths that are in there. They're made of calcium carbonate and uh, sometimes they're called ear stones. And as you move, the saccule changes and that allows those utricles to kind of fall to one side or fall to the other side. And you can kind of see that here. Here's all the otoliths on top of this otolithic membrane that's on top of these hair cells. And as you move, those hair cells tilt and the otoliths crumble. Then you move the other way and they crumble the other way and so on and so forth. This is just so that your brain knows where you are. So when you change your head position, the otoliths are on top of the otolithic membrane, and then when you tilt, again, the otoliths shift from side to side. This picture kind of shows it better. There you are. Now you've tilted your head back. You can pause the video, go back, and review. Let's talk about the cochlear duct. It's long coil. This is the snail-shaped structure. Uh, it's made of the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani. The bony labyrinth encases the three ducts of the oval window and the round window. Um, and the hair cells of the cochlear duct create that spiral organ called the organ of corti. The organ of corti runs inside the cochlea, and this is where the sound recognition takes place. So now we're, we've moved from this balance organ over here, the semicircular canals, and we're talking about our cochlea. There's a cross section of the cochlea. Let's talk about the spiral organ. The cochlear duct is separated from the vestibular membrane and the basilar membrane. So the spiral organ is in the cochlear duct on the basilar membrane, and processes of that spiral organ come in contact with that tectorial membrane. It'll make sense more when you see the picture. The sensory neurons are, motoring, are monitoring that hair cell movement, and as the hair cells move, it's gonna fire off into the vestibular cochlear nerve and communicate with the brain. So inside our organ, here's this, this, the cochlea itself, right, is this snail shell. Inside the snail shell are chambers, right? These little chambers have uh, different sections to them. One's called the scale of vestibuli, one's called the cochlear duct, one's called the scale of tympani. Please stop licking me. Um, sorry, I don't like being licked by a dog uh, when I'm talking. So, um, inside these special areas is a basilar membrane. So, all three of these channels have a basilar membrane. That basilar membrane has hair cells on it, and the hair cells come in contact with the tectorial membrane. This tectorial membrane is connected to our vestibular cochlear nerve. So as these hair cells move, the tectorial membrane moves, and that's going to communicate with the vestibular cochlear nerve. So the position of these hair cells in these different areas is going to uh, dictate how much this tectorial membrane moves, which is going to help with our sound interpretation. So uh, let's talk about this pressure wave. Sound waves of the tympanic membrane. It's like a drum, right? Trigger changes in pressure in the perilymph of our cochlea. The basilar membrane can kind of bounce up and down in response to that pressure. Hair cells are then going to be pushed into that tectorial membrane and distorted, and more movement means more hair, hair cells and more rows of cells are stimulated, and hence you're going to be hearing something louder. So you can pause the video, go back, and review. 
Hearing is just that perception of sound. Sound is waves, right? Waves is pressure within the air. Each wave is going to compress or move that molecule, and the distance between adjacent waves is called a wavelength. So um, different parts of our tectorial membranes are sensitive to different wavelengths. So if it's sensed on this part, it's going to sound like this bitch, and if it's sensed on this part, it's going to sound like this bitch, right? So just different parts of that membrane are going to sense different wavelengths. Here you see all of the different wavelengths coming in to the ear. Frequency is the number of waves, um, and it's usually measured in hertz, and it's, it's that pitch that I was just mentioning. You don't have to be too concerned with the physics here of wavelengths and, and frequency, but this is just to get you to understand how sound is understood and sensed. So the amplitude of the wave of uh, the sound wave is determined by the amount of energy that's carried, and that's that's calculated through frequency and vibration, and that's called the intensity. It's measured in decibels. This is just giving you some examples of relative sounds. The lowest audible sound would be at a zero. A soft whisper would be like at a thirty, or something like a rocket launching pad would be one sixty. This is showing you how dangerous some sounds are. Busy traffic, a noisy restaurant, some damage could could occur if it's continuous over long periods of time. Heavy city traffic, an alarm clock at two feet, factory noise can cause damage after about eight hours of exposure. Why? Because again, those little hair cells are hitting that tectorial membrane and they're gonna get worn, on, worn out after a while. So sound waves strike, strike that um, tectorial membrane to make it vibrate. Vibration is gonna make those sounds resonate and the tympanic membrane resonates those sound waves into the inner ear. The tympanic membrane causes pressure waves in the cochlea. The basilar membrane is more flexible in some areas than in others, which is why it's going to help detect some frequencies at different locations. Um, so here, again, different locations throughout the cochlea are going to detect different uh, um, pitches, like I said. Those, they might detect some on this end or others at another end, depending on the pitch. <coughs> Here's the whole process, putting it all together. Sound waves enter the tympanic membrane, hit the tympanic membrane, bang on it like a drum. Drum. The movement of the tympanic membrane causes our ossicles to vibrate and move. Then our stapes is kind of knocking on the oval window, establishing pressure within the perilymph. So now we have pressure waves here. The pressure waves distort the basilar membrane on their way to the round window. So now we get to the round window, and now the, um, the vibrations of the basilar membrane cause vibrations of the hair cells, and vibrations of the hair cells will move the tectorial membrane, and all of that information is gathered by our vestibular cochlear nerve going back up to the brain. That's cranial nerve number eight. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about eyelids and eyelashes. We're moving on to vision. These are our uh, other special sensory organs. You have an eyelash. The eyelash's job is just preventing foreign material from going into the eye. Eyelid or palpebrae is the continuation of our skin covering our eye. They blink, right? Uh, and then you have your lacrimal caruncle, which is that thick pad, like triangular area on the medial side of your eye. That's where um, there are some glands that can secrete things. So conjunctiva is the inner surface of our eyelids and the outer surface of our eye. It's a, a mucous membrane with special stratified squamous epithelial cells. It's continuous with the cornea of the eye, which is the transparent part of the eye. Uh, there's also tarsal glands or mebonium glands, which are little sebaceous glands on the inner eyelid, and they secrete um, like a fatty protein product to help keep the eyelids from sticking together. There you see them. Uh, tears are produced by the lacrimal gland. They're there to reduce friction, remove debris. They actually have a bacterial, uh, antibacterial property to them called a lysozyme. They provide nutrients and oxygen to the con conjunctiva. Our lacrimal ap apparatus includes the lacrimal gland, the tear ducts, the lacrimal puncta, which are the little pores that drain uh, where the tears collect. They're they are there with paired lacrimal canaliculi, which are the little uh, canals connecting the puncta to the sac where the tears are produced. And the nasolacrimal duct carries the tears into the meatus of the nasal cavity, which is why sometimes if you're crying a lot, your nose runs also. There are all these structures. Notice the lacrimal glands on the lateral side of the eye. 
and series of networks and ducts um, drain the uh, the tear ducts go into the eye on the lateral side and what we usually call our tear duct is actually the lacrimal puncta that's draining our uh, tears out of the eye as they if they over accumulate so conjunctivitis is also called pink eye that's from damage and irritation of the conjunctival surface usually it's the redness is caused from the dilated blood vessels it could be a pathogenic infection it could be an allergy it could be a chemical irritation there's conjunctivitis does not look fun pause the video here go back and answer these three questions let's move on to the outer part of the eye the fibrous layer so our Eyeball has three layers. You have a fibrous layer, a vascular layer, and a neural layer. The fibrous layer is the outermost layer. It consists of our cornea and sclera, and it's basically there for mechanical support, physical protection. It also provides an attachment site for our extrinsic eye muscles to help our eye move around. It has the cornea, which is allowing that passage of light into the pupil so that we can see. The vascular layer is for blood vessels and lymphatics. It's made of the choroid and the iris and the ciliary body. The choroid is our capillary network. It's just underneath of the cornea. The iris has the blood vessels. It is a small um, sphincter muscle which is going to contract and dilate to allow and adjust the size of our pupil. Um, the vascular layer also secretes and reabsorbs what's called the aqueous humor, which is kind of a like a tear-like watery fluid. Um, and then the ciliary body is uh, the part that controls the shape of the lens. There are these little tiny muscles that contract and um, allow our lens to change shape. The neural layer of our eye is called the retina. This is the innermost layer of our eye. It consists of an outer pigmented layer to absorb the light and, an, and a thick inner layer which has our photoreceptors that are sensitive to light. So here you see it all put together. We have that outer fibrous layer we have this kind of pink uh, vascular layer in there. And then the very innermost layer is our retinal layer or our neural layer. Um, and then inside these chambers, we have different types of fluid. So in the front, we have this aqueous humor, which is very um, thin and watery. And then back here in this chamber, we have the vitreous humor, which is more jelly-like. So let's talk about those things. The ciliary body and the lens divide the eye into the anterior and posterior cavities. The anterior cavity has an anterior and posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is from the cornea to the iris, and the posterior chamber is from the iris to the ciliary body and the lens. So it's just a very small division there. The posterior cavity has the vitreous humor or vitreous body, which is a very gelatinous substance. Here you see what I mean. Posterior chamber, anterior chamber, this is all the anterior cavity, posterior cavity. Posterior cavity has the vitreous humor, anterior cavity has the aqueous humor. There are six in extrinsic eye muscles. They all control the position of the eye. Superior oblique, superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior oblique and inferior rectus, and medial rectus. They're all named after what they are. The superior oblique is on top and diagonal. Right, superior rectus is on top and straight. Lateral rectus is on the outside and straight. Very, very easily named. Once you know the um, position terms, these eye muscles are, are pretty straightforward. Let's talk about what they do. And again, if you just think about a lever and pulley system, if you have a uh, superior oblique muscle, it's kind of going, can okay, you see it? It's like on the top and, and diagonal. If it's going like that and that moves, that's going to move your eye kind of up and inward, right? A superior rectus like this going across the top, when that contracts, it's just going to move your eye up. So just think about it like that. Think about how that eye would move in response to being contracted or being pulled in different directions. There they are from an anterior view showing you some directional terms. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about eye anatomy. As I mentioned, the cornea allowing light to enter. It has no blood vessels. It just basically gets its nutrients from the tears that are constantly washing over the surface of the eye. The lens is held in place by suspensory ligaments. Those suspensory ligaments are connected to the ciliary body, part of that vascular tunic. The tension on the ligaments help keeps the lens um, less spherical. It's, it's more oblong. 
Uh, the retina has the photoreceptors and other supporting cells and neurons. The choroid is our blood vessels. The sclera is the fibrous connective tissue stabilizing the outer shape of the eye, and that's where our outer eye muscles are inserting. Let's talk about how the eye sees. Light passes through the center of the cornea, goes to the center of the lens, and it goes to a specific location on the retina. So it's all trying to go to one spot. There's an imaginary line from what you see to the back of the eye. It's called the visual axis. So the highest concentration of photoreceptors is at that point in the back of your eye. It's called the fovea. So the fovea is your site of sharpest vision. You know, just from living, that when you're looking, so right now, for instance, I'm looking at this little black camera that's sitting on top of my computer monitor. But I can still see the rest of my office. I still see my red notebook over here, my cup of coffee over there, my papers that I have pinned up on the wall over here, I can still see all that, even though I'm looking at you. Well, looking at this black camera, hoping that it's you, right? So I can still see all of those things. What I'm saying is, this light that's coming from this camera, going to the back of my eyes, going to that phobia. That's my part, my, my location of a sharpest visual acuity. Everything else is going to the other parts where I, I'm not seeing as much detail. I see that I see that they're there, I see that they exist, but I can't tell you exactly what all those things look like what all the words are etc because they're in my periphery so optic nerve is cranial nerve number two and that's carrying all that information back to the brain there it is all those parts that i just mentioned let's talk about how our pupils constrict and dilate so you have pupillary dilator muscles and pupillary constrictor muscles they're all controlled by your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems um, and they're smooth muscles so your dilator muscles are activated by sympathetic, dilating, you're nervous, you're fight or flight, you want to take in all the light, you want to take in all the information. Parasympathetic, rest and digest. Your pupils are going to constrict, doesn't really matter, you're resting, right? There you see it. You can pause the video, go back and review. Let's get into a little bit of physics here so we understand how light works. Light is refracted or bent when it passes from one substance to another. So light's traveling through the air, and then it hits my cornea, and it bends. And then it hits the lens, and it bends. So it's going to bend a little bit every time it changes mediums, and that's called refraction. So um, the whole purpose of your lens is to calculate that refraction and get the light to focus on that fovea on the back of your retina, on your focal point. So here you see some thing that you want to Look at, this is your, your focal point on the back of your retina. Here's all the light that's coming in. And the whole job of your, sorry, I keep yawning. I really need some more coffee. The whole purpose of this lens is to pull this light in and get it to bend so that all that light goes back to that focal point. So when you're looking at a something that's very close, right? something that's right in front of your face, your lens is going to be shaped one way. But when you're looking at something that's further away, your lens might be shaped differently. And again, that is all because um, you have those suspensory ligaments held in place by the cilia of your body that are pulling on your lens to either flex it or contract it, right, to get it to change shape. This is called accommodation. Our lens can't really move, but it can change shape. So you have close vision where your uh, cilia muscles contract, moving the cilia of your body closer to the lens, reducing tension, making that lens be thicker so the light bends more. Distance vision is when the ciliary muscles relax and the ciliary body moves away from the lens. Suspensory ligaments pull on the lens more, flattening the lens. There you see what I mean. Light from each point on the object is focused back on the retina. The image on the retina, though, is actually inverted and reversed. So your brain compensates. And so um, percep the perception of the original orientation is flipped around in your brain. So what you're actually seeing on the back of your retina, again, because of refraction, the actual image that's projected on the back of your retina is upside down and backwards. But then what you actually see is the right thing. Or is it? Are we all just living upside down? Deep thoughts. All right. The inner limit of clear vision to view closer objects uh, requires that thickening of the lens. It requires more refraction. To limit how close or clear vision occurs, you have to just 
um, have a certain elasticity of your lens. Children can focus very, very closely. Um, it, it doesn't matter how close something is. They can look at it and see it, right? Um, but with age, that lens gets stiffer, so it's not going to be able to, to thicken up as, as easily. Adults can't focus on things that are close, as close as children can, because our lens just isn't as flexible anymore. So this is why most adults uh, eventually will wear glasses because they get farsighted. They start, um, you know, their arms just aren't long enough to hold, you know, whatever it is that they're they're trying to read. They'll just kind of hold up, you know, hold up the the thing and just kind of well, okay, I can't. And and again, that's just because their lens can't focus. Pause the video. Go back and answer these questions. We're going to move on and talk about the retina. The retina is the pigmented part of the eye. It absorbs the light that passes through, uh, and it prevents visual echo, so it prevents the, the light from bouncing around. And there's actually a biochemical reaction that happens when you see light. The neural part of the retina has photoreceptors. There's ganglion cells and an optic disc. The optic disc is where there's no photoreceptors. It's called our blind spot. This is where all the axons of our optic nerve leave our eye. Um, the ganglion cells is the innermost layer, and the photoreceptors is the outermost layer. So let's talk about how this, is there a better picture? Yeah, there's a better picture. Okay, I'll just show you this, and then I'll show you the better picture in a minute. So here you see the overall, this is our posterior chamber. Here you can really see where all those axons are gathering. This is that blind spot we were just talking about, and there's several layers. This pigmented layer back here, and the uh, neural layer. On the front side. Here's what the retina actually looks like when you use a, uh, uh, an op, op, the, I can never say it, the little thing that you use to see your eye. It begins with, oh, an ophthalmoscope. Oh, I always butcher big words. All right, let's talk about those photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are rods and cones. Rods are good for black and white vision. And cones are good for color vision, cone C, right? Cones are for color vision. They're sharp, they're clear, they have more visual acuity, um, and they're highly dense at that fovea. Rods are highly sensitive and allow us to see in dim light. Uh, there are also bipolar cells. They're not photoreceptors. They're the connections between the rods and cones. So here you see this whole setup. This is the back of the retina. Light comes in, passes through these neurons. It's Keeps on going, keeps on going, keeps on going. Hits these rods and cones back here. Hits this pigmented part, and that pigmented part of the retina will activate these rods and cones. Rod, they're special, you know, receptors. So then these rods and cones communicate with these bipolar cells. These bipolar cells communicate with these ganglion cells. And guess what? The ganglion cells are basically our sensory neurons, which are all going to bundle up and take the information back to the brain. So all of these accents are going to bundle up and make that optic nerve. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these questions. Let's talk about photoreceptor structures. You have an outer segment and an inner segment. Rods and cones have these two segments. That outer segment is the flattened plates or discs. Um, this is where our visual pigments are. The pigments are derivatives of something called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is a pigment that's found in the rods. Rhodopsin is composed of two things, opsin and retinol. These are derivatives from vitamin A, which is why people say when you eat vitamin A, like in carrots, you get good eyesight. That's pretty much true. The type of opsin is going to determine the, the wavelength that's absorbed by, by the retinol. There's an inner segment, which has major organelles. These organelles are responsible for responding to other things of cell, um, cell function other than photoreception. So the outer segment is, is the photoreception part of the inner segments for all the other stuff that the cells need. So here you see what I'm talking about. Here's the pigmented layer, and now we have our cones and our rods. And you can see why they're called that because they're just shaped differently. The rod has those discs. These discs are arranged right on top of each other, and in those discs, are these rhodopsin molecules. The rhodopsin molecule, again, is there for specific wavelengths of light. So uh, light strikes the visual pigment, the retinal molecules change the shape, changes the permeability of the outer segment, and then that light energy is converted into a nerve impulse, basically how it happens. So light is absorbed when that retinal uh, changes shape. 
And here you see this photon of light coming in. We have this kind of bent key looking like structure. Oh, now it's a straight key looking structure. And that is because the opsin has been activated and um, a neurotransmitter has been released. Then there's changes in the, in the cell, and now we're going to allow the neurotransmitter to, to be released. Here you see it. After absorbing the photon, the rhodopsin breaks down and um, releases the uh, retinol and opsin. It's called bleaching. Uh, then the retinol is converted into its original shape. And then once the original, uh, the, uh, the retinol, sorry, I lost my words for a second there. Once the retinol is returned to its original shape, then it can recombine with the opsin and is ready to be reused again. So this whole process just happens over and over again. Notice that it uses energy, it uses ATP to do this. So you need ATP to see light. Isn't that crazy? So let's talk about wavelengths of light. Uh, you really have three types of cones. You have blue cones, green cones, and red cones. Um, these cones are just me meant to detect different wavelengths of light. As you may recall from any high school physics course, uh, light is different colors because it has different energy quantities, which is measured in wavelengths. So uh, the majority of the cones that we have are red cones. Color blindness comes from lacking one or more of those pigmented cones. Here you see uh, the general wavelengths that these cones will receive. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. We also have depth perception when we're thinking about vision. It's not just color vision, it's not just interpretation. We also have to understand how we see depth. And this is from the areas, our visual fields from our right and left eyes, they overlap. And that gives us this concept of how far away something is. The visual cortex is receiving this information, perceiving it, and letting us know that type of information. The brain is basically comparing the relative positions um, from the two eyes. So it's called binocular vision, and that's because we're overlapping. And notice that that information comes in, and some of the information goes to the right side of the brain, and some of the information goes to the left side of the brain from each eye. So you can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. There are several uh, accommodation problems that can come about from vision. You can have emetropia or normal vision. This is when distant objects can be close clearly focused, no problem. Myopia is nearsightedness. You can see close objects most clearly. This is when the eyeball is too deep, the curvature of the lens is too great, the image of distant objects is just focused right off of the front of the retina. So it can be corrected with an extra lens to divert that light. Hyperopia or farsightedness, when you can see far objects. This is when the lens is too flat. So the ciliary muscles have to contract to focus. Uh, this is good. Close range len lenses can't refract enough, so it's corrected with a converging lens for additional refraction. So emetropia, myopia, you add that extra lens. See how that focal point is just in front? So you add that extra lens, the diverging lens, uh, or a concave lens, and that light will now be focused. And farsightedness, the focal point's too far back, so you use a convex lens or a converging lens to get that light to focus appropriately. So you could also reshape the cornea. One way to correct these is to have um, surgery. It's very popular. Photorefractive surgery, PRK, uses a computer-guided laser to remove micrometers or micrometers uh, from the surface of your cornea. There's also LASIK, laser assisted in situ keratomaleusis. Said it 10 times fast. Uh, it's basically reshaping the inner layers of the cornea. 70% uh, of LASIK patients get their normal vision back. Corneal scarring is very rare uh, because the cornea uh, is not very vascular, it's already fibrous, it's already basically scar tissue. So um, there is the surgical procedure happening. I kind of don't want to know what's happening. Um, I don't think, well, my eyes are, I don't wear glasses or contacts, but I don't know if I would want to see that process before I went into it. Uh, here are those three questions. You can pause the video and go back and answer. Let's talk about some disorders of olfaction. 
Uh, disorders of olfaction could come from head injuries or just normal age-related changes because the olfactory receptors are constantly replaced by stem cell division, um, but the total number of them uh, declines with age, so our receptors become less sensitive. Same thing with gustation. Um, taste buds can occur damage through inflammation or infections, damage to cranial nerves, and age-related changes, just like anything, um, it's going to become less sensitive to um, the stimulus. Cataracts are, is a condition in which the lens loses its transparency, so the lens becomes cloudy. Uh, the most common form is called senile cataracts. This is just a natural con consequence of aging. Um, basically, the, the lens becomes non-functional. It can be replaced by an artificial lens, though. There is an eye with a cataract. There are also equilibrium disorders. Going back to our ear, vertigo is the illusion of movement. You uh, basically have a, an internal receptor complex in your ear. Anything that disturbs the endolymph, like flushing the external acoustic meatus with cold water or consumption of alcohol or other drugs, can give you this feeling. Um, you also have motion sickness, where you get headaches, sweating, nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, and then you can take drugs to suppress that um, stimulation. Winding things down, you could have conductive deafness. Conductive deafness is from interference with the normal transfer of vibrations to tympanic, from the tympanic membrane to the oval window. This could be caused by wax or water or scarring or maybe something's wrong with your inner ear, your middle ear ossicles. You could also have nerve deafness. This is when there's actually a problem with the nervous membrane or with the cochlea itself. There's something wrong with that auditory pathway. Uh, bacterial or viral infections can kill those receptor cells, so that could be a cause of nerve deafness. Hearing loss occurs with age. Uh, it's just accumulated damage from all of the loud noises and other injuries that you've been exposed to your whole life. It's basically decreasing the flexibility of the tympanic membrane, which is going to decrease the motion of those ossicles, which is going to decrease the, the sound that's projected into the cochlea. Those ossicles can get very stiff. Um, and there could also be ossification at the oval window. So um, obviously hearing aids are there for that, to assist with that. Finally, here are your last three review questions. I hope I didn't go too fast. I probably did, but that's what videos are awesome for. You can go back and re-listen, pause it and re-listen. Um, please let me know what questions you have. This chapter shared a lot of information with you, general senses and special senses. Um, so kind of a wide range of topics. But that's how your book presented it, so that's how I presented it to you. Let me know what questions you have, and have an awesome day.